Memory trade-offs for near collision by Gator Laurent. And this is going to put on the Thank you. So I'm going to talk. for near collision. And by near collision, I mean generic uh, algorithms for near collisions. So first, uh, let's talk a little bit about hash functions. So this is going to be about hash functions. Uh, the, the, the ideal model for a hash function is a public uh, random oracle. So what this means is that it should take uh, any kind of document as input and give as output a random string. And for every new document, you should get a new random output. But of course, if you get twice the same input, you should get twice the same output. That's uh, what you try to achieve with a hash function. So of course it's not really possible to have this kind of oracle thing. What we will get is just a fixed function. So we have more, some more concrete security goals, which are pre-image attacks, second pre-image attack, and uh, response to collision attacks. Those are the main three uh, security goals that we look at when we build a hash function or when we analyze a hash function. But those three uh, goals are not really enough because hash functions are used in many, many different uh, settings using many different assumptions. So we, we also have to look at some more security objectives like uh, max security, multi-collision resistance, resistance to parading attacks, and so on and so on. And in particular, one notion that um, we sometimes look at is the notion of near collision. So what is a near collision? Uh, well, it means trying to find two different messages so that the hamming distance between the hash of those messages is uh, small. So by small, we mean smaller than some fixed bound. So it's interesting because it's a kind of generalization of a collision attack instead of, well, collision attack would be a near collision with distance zero. And in a near collision, we allow some more freedom. Uh, if we look at cryptanalysis uh, for a near collision attack, if we look at attacks, they often use similar techniques than uh, real collision attacks. So it's a, a, good, uh, a good idea to, to measure the security margin. We can allow a bit more freedom to the adversary by letting him do near collision attacks instead of uh, full collision attacks. Also, sometimes when you have a near collision attack, you can turn it into a real collision attack. So it doesn't happen always, and usually it doesn't, but sometimes, like for Shawan, we don't know how to make a full collision attack in one block, but we can use several blocks to turn near collisions into full collisions. And in fact, if you look at the literature, there are uh, many attack papers which consider this notion of near collisions because uh, it allows them to go for a few more rounds. So, uh, if you have all those papers doing a new collision attack, a natural question is what would be the generic complexity of a new collision attack? So if someone claims they can find a new collision for a Sky 512 with 100 active bits and it costs 2 to the 100, should it be considered as an attack or not? Well, this depends on what's the generic complexity of this kind of attack. And that's what we're going to discuss in this talk. So what is the generic collision of finding uh, those new collision attacks without looking inside the compression? So if we look at uh, the state of the art, there are of course several results known about this. Uh, the first one... <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so uh, we know that there is a lower bound for the complexity of near collision <coughs> attack, and we know that there is a simple algorithm to reach it, but this algorithm needs a lot of memory. So on the other hand, we have memoryless algorithms based on truncation or based on uh, covering codes. But those algorithms, of course, are more expensive than uh, the slower one. So there is kind of gap in between, and uh, that could be a topic of this talk, trying to kind of bridge uh, this gap somehow. So first, let's talk about this uh, lower bound. So it's a uh, very simple analysis. If we have a hash function, and we compute 
the hash function i times on some inputs. This gives us about i square uh, pairs of output, of course. And then if we look at each pair, there is a certain probability that it will be a near collision. And then we can uh, derive the lower bound, and this lower bound uh, is just here. But we can see that near collision attacks are easier than collision attack. Of course, this is expected. And the factor is uh, square root of bw of n, where bw of n is the size of a humming ball uh, of Regis W, meaning uh, the number of uh, words that are close enough to uh, the zero word. So that's uh, the lower bound. Now, uh, of course, it's relatively easy to reach it. What you just have to do is compute the hash function a number of times, so the same number of times as uh, this bound, of course. And then you look at each pair of output and you compute the humming distance. And hopefully, one of them will be uh, small enough to be a near So, uh, the good thing about this simple algorithm is that you only compute the hash function i times, so you're going to reach this lower bound. But the bad thing is that you have this loop here where you have to go over uh, each pair of outputs. So you have something in i square, you have i square comparison and i square memory access. And in fact, this i square will be bigger than 2 to the n over 2. So in practice, if you implement this algorithm, it's going to be less efficient than a full collision algorithm. So it doesn't make a lot of sense in practice. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the main problem with this. You, you need uh, a lot of comparison, a lot of memory access, and also a relatively large uh, memory. So to overcome this, several works uh, have been trying to do near, uh, memoryless near collision. And the reason for this is that if we look at collision attack, of course we know that there are very efficient memoryless algorithms, which are just as good as uh, algorithms using a lot of memory. So the, the idea is, can we do the same for near, near collision? Could we build a memoryless algorithm that would be as good as the one that uses a lot of memory. Uh, so first, how does it work for, for collisions? Well, uh, a very well-known algorithm would be polar rows, and it looks uh, something like this. What you do is you iterate the hash function, so you start from some random point, and you just hash it, and then you hash again, and again, and again, and again. And you're going to build a list uh, of points. And when your list gets big enough, you will have uh, a collision in this list. And then if you look at the graph, going to iterate, iterate, iterate. At some point, you reach a point that you have already seen. And then you're going to cycle uh, in this loop. And then you can use uh, a variety of uh, algorithms to detect this. So uh, if you want to use this uh, same idea for new collision attacks, it's not going to work because uh, the main feature uh, that we use for those memoryless collision algorithms is that uh, if you start from two random points and you iterate uh, chains of uh, computation from those, if there is a collision at some point, if you keep iterating, uh, the points will still be colliding. So you can detect the collision later than uh, when it actually happens. So that's, that's a, a very important feature for uh, memoryless collision attacks. If you look at near collision now, if you start from two random points, you iterate, and at some point you have a near collision here, like those two points are very close. But then if you keep iterating, they will not stay close to each other. because They're just different, so when you hash them, you get different values. Then they will be far away. So you cannot do this, this trick of uh, detecting collisions later on. So you have to use uh, another kind of, uh, of, of techniques to find a uh, new collision without uh, this memory requirement. So uh, there have been two uh, main uh, ideas proposed to do this. So the first one is to use truncation. So it's very simple. You take your uh, hash function with n bit outputs and you just truncate off some part of the output. Now you look at this truncated hash function and you and you look for collisions in these truncated hash functions. So finding a collision is easy. We can do it without memory. And when you have a collision in the truncated function, you look back at the full outputs, and you will just have those extra bits that have been truncated, which will be uh, basically random values. And uh, for instance, if you just truncate W bits, then you have only W bits that you don't control, so there will be at most W active bits. And this will give you a near collision with distance uh, less than W. So this is good because the complexity of this uh, very simple algorithm is now 2 to the n minus w over 2. So it is now more efficient than uh, a basic collision attack. So this is if you just truncate w bits. Now you can also truncate more bits. If you truncate, for instance, 2w plus 1 bits, then you have uh, less, uh, less remaining bits. So the collision attack on those remaining bits will be more efficient. And if you look at uh, those bits when you put them back, if you have 2w plus 1 bits with probability 1 half, only w of them will be active. So uh, now you just have to repeat this twice, and uh, every other time you will get a new collision which is uh, close enough. And now the complexity is much better because you have uh, n minus 
2w minus y in the exponent, and you just add, add to 2 at the end. So this is a lot more efficient. And you can, uh, you, can do, uh, you can look at it in a more general way. You can say, like, well, let's shrink it tau bits, and let's see what happens. So when you shrink it tau bits, you have to find collisions in uh, n minus tau remaining bits. And then you have to look at the probability that uh, those tau bits will have a distance of less than w. But when you do this, uh, this full analysis, so there's a very nice paper by, by uh, Lambert Germain and Teufel, which uh, studies exactly this situation. And they show that the optimal value uh, of tau to do this is about uh, 2 plus square root of 2 times w minus 1. And when you do this, you get uh, this complexity. So that's, uh, that's it about using uh, truncation in a memoryless setting. So the optimal complexity is uh, something like this. Now, if we look at it in another way, uh, what we're doing basically is that we're trying to build a function f so that if f of x is equal to f of y, then x and y are uh, close enough. And that's what we do when we truncate. We truncate, then we find collisions, and we say that if there is a collision in the truncated version, then when we look at the full version, they will be uh, somewhat close, because of course all the non truncated bits are alike. And when we look at it in this way, uh, a relatively natural thing to do is to look at covering codes. Because uh, this kind of notion here is very natural in a, in a setting of error correcting codes, and then uh, what you're looking for is the correcting code, so uh, covering code, sorry. So if you have a uh, decoding function f of a covering code, you have exactly this. Now you just look for collisions in f of h, and when you have a collision in f of h, this implies that you have a double linear collision. And uh, the correct setting is if you have a covering code with ranges r, then you get a new collision with distance at most two hours. And this approach uh, usually gives better results. If you use a covering code, you can get better complexity than uh, just using truncation. So uh, let's go back to the outline of this talk. So now we have complexity of lower bound, the best complexity for memory less algorithms. So our goal now is to uh, build something in between. And how are we going to do that? We're going to look at time memory traders. Because if you are actually going to implement uh, this kind of attack, so you're not going to use the memory full algorithm because it uses, not, uh, it uses just too many memory and there are too many memory access, so it's not going to work. But you don't have to go all the way to memory less than <coughs> when you When you do these kind of computations, usually you have some memory available. Uh, I mean, if you're going to use a cluster, you have, you have uh, quite a lot of RAM available. If you use GPU, you also have a large amount of memory. Whatever the, the machine you're going to use, you, you probably have some memory. So now what we try to do is use this memory to, to improve the complexity. Uh, so uh, let's look at time memory trade-off. So if we look back at, uh, at truncation algorithms, when we try to look to find new collisions using truncation, so what we do basically, we, we choose some parameter tau, then we truncate tau bits, and we look for collisions in the truncated hash functions. Uh, so if, if we look at uh, how things evolve when we change tau, if uh, the more we truncate, the more collisions we're going to need to find a, a small enough distance. But each collision becomes cheaper because you have less remaining bits that you're trying to collide. Uh, so now, when, when you truncate many bits, you're going to need a lot of collisions. And then, how expensive is it to find a lot of collisions? So if you do it in a memoryless setting, then finding i collisions will cost i times 2 to the n minus tau of 2. So you just have to repeat the collision attack i times. That's if you don't use any memory. But if you have some memory available, then what you can do is when you have your first collision, you can keep some state that will help you to find the second collision faster than the first one. And if we do something like this, then the full algorithm will be more efficient. Because we, we can, basically what we're going to do is pick a larger tau so that we need many collisions, but we will get each of them more efficiently because we use uh, some memory. So we get below this. Uh, figure here. So how does this actually work? Well, uh, there's a very nice uh, paper by, by uh, Van Oshot and Wiener, where they talk about parallel collision, collision search. And uh, basically what they do is they use an approach based on a uh, distinguished point. So we say that the point, the point is distinguished if it has some number of training zeros, for instance. And then you're going to build chains of iteration. You start from some random point, you iterate, you iterate, you iterate, and when you reach distinguished points, uh, you stop. And then you store this value x and this value y in a table. And you repeat this, you repeat this. But at some point you will get a value y that you already had seen before. And then this means that two chains are colliding. And then you can start again from the, the beginning. 
and actually the human population. And when you do this, uh, if you look at the complexity analysis, the cost of finding I collisions uh, will be less than I times the cost of finding one collision. And more precisely, if you, if you look for a relatively small number of collisions, meaning you have more memory than the number of collisions you want, then you have a speed of square root of I, which is optimal. On the other hand, if you don't have enough memory, if you want more collisions than uh, the size of your memory, then the speed of is about uh, square root of n. Now, if we want to combine those to get uh, a full expression that's valid everywhere, what we did uh, in our paper is that we just sum those two expressions. And what happens is that when i is uh, much smaller or much larger than n, then one of those expressions becomes negligible. So we get uh, a decent, uh, a, good, a good value. And when we are in between, when i is about the same size as m, we did some experiments, and this expression here is uh, relatively accurate. So we have a good, uh, good evaluation of the complexity of finding i collisions. Now, when we plug this into the, the simple truncation-based algorithm, we can compute uh, now the, the complexity of this algorithm using standard memory, using a time memory trade-off. And if we do the analysis of the complexity, we can see that for small values of tau, the complexity is decreasing, but for large values of tau, the complexity is increasing. So this means that the minimum will be somewhere in the middle. And uh, in the middle, that means when i is about the same as m. And then the complexity will be about uh, this value here, so 2 to the n over 2 over square root of pw of tau. That's, that's uh, the complexity of this, uh, this truncation-based algorithm when we use a time memory trade. And it's actually uh, much more efficient than in a memory less setting. So to, to see uh, a little bit how this works, uh, here are some, uh, some examples. So I'm looking at a 10 near collision in a 128-bit hash function. So that could be MD5, or that could be SHA3 truncated to 128 bits, or whatever you want. And if you look first at uh, previous works, so we, there is a, uh, a lower bound that I explained in the beginning. And in this case, the lower bound is about 2 to the 40. And then the best known algorithm is using coloring codes, and it has a complexity of 2 to the 52.5. We can also show that any covering-based algorithm will have complexity at least 2 to the 50. Now, if we look at uh, previous truncation techniques, we have a complexity of uh, 54 or 53. So it's above uh, uh, the covering code approach. But now when we use a time memory trade-off, with just one gigabyte of memory, so one gigabyte these days is pretty small, maybe you even have this kind of memory on your cell phone, and if we use this, then we can go to, down to a complexity of 2 to 47, so it's much better than uh, previous algorithms, and we, we, we can get relatively close to, to the lower bound, I mean, much closer than previously. So, um, So, uh, now let's go to the, the second contribution of this paper. So, the first one was time memory trade-off, and now uh, another thing we do is try to combine uh, the truncation approach and the covering code approach. So, how can we uh, combine those two techniques? Well, it's actually very simple. Um, what we do is just, first we truncate the hash function, and then what we're going to do is, instead of looking for collisions in the, the remaining bits, we look for near collision in the remaining bits. So it may seem a little bit strange, so I'm saying, to, how do you find near collision? Well, you truncate and you find near collision. So how do you find those near collision now? So of course you're not going to truncate again, that would not make sense. But what you can do is use a, a covering code. <coughs> so uh, first you truncate, and then you use a covering code to find near collision with the remaining bits. Uh, so uh, how does that work? Well, you have to choose uh, some parameters. You have to choose tau, how many bits you truncate, and you have to choose r, the radius of the covering code, which means how many bits will be in, uh, in this part. And when you look at the full new collision at the end, you will have active bits both in uh, this part here due to the covering code and in this part here due to the truncation. So uh, you have a relatively large parameter space. You can choose both r and tau. And if you look at special cases, it actually covers all previous algorithms. If you choose tau equals to zero, meaning you're not truncating anything, then you just have uh, a covering code algorithm, like, like was uh, proposed before. On the other hand, if you choose r equals to zero, then you're not using any covering code, and you're just using truncation. So this algorithm is more general than uh, all the previous one. And so it will be at least as good as the previous algorithms. That, that's a good thing. And it's still uh, very simple, what, what we're actually doing. Uh, when we look at the, the complexity of this algorithm, which if you try to do an analysis, uh, the bad thing is 
I don't know how to, to give you a nice expression of what would be the optimal tau or the optimal R. I don't have the kind of analysis uh, I did earlier for just the truncation case. So that's a bad thing. However, the good thing is uh, it's relatively easy to compute the complexity if you fix some value of tau and some value of R. So you can look at the paper for the details and there's actually uh, a piece of code that will just do the computation for you. So now what you can do is uh, just try all possible values of tau, all possible values of R, and just pick the best one. And that's, uh, that's how we're going to do. And now you can just compute, uh, depending on the amount of memory you have, depending on the value n, uh, the, the size of your hash function, and the value w, uh, the number of active bits you want in the end, you can just compute this for all possible tau, all possible r's, and you can pick the best one. And you get those uh, complexity figure here. And you can see that uh, it's uh, usually much better than uh, previous algorithms. It can get uh, much closer to the lower bound. And uh, something interesting is that usually you have both a truncation and a covering code that are involved. So we're not in one of those uh, degenerate cases here. We are usually somewhere in the middle. So we use both truncation and covering codes. And that actually gets better algorithms than using just truncation or just uh, covering codes. <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, the end of the talk. So to summarize uh, what we did in here, so the first contribution is uh, that we propose a way to use time memory trade-offs with the truncation approach. And the basic idea is use a larger tau, so truncate more, and we need a lot of collisions. And we use uh, a nice time memory trade-off uh, by Fonoshot and Wiener, and we can find i collisions more efficiently than for a cost of i times uh, 2 to the n over 2. So that's uh, the first result. And the second one is that we show how to combine the truncation approach and the covering code approach in a very simple way, just truncate and then use covering code to find new collision in the remaining parts. And all of this leads to a relatively significant uh, improvement over the complexity. For instance, if you look at 10-year collision for, uh, for MD5, so there's actually an example in the paper, so we did implement all this. And if you look at uh, previous algorithms, the best complexity was uh, 2 to the 52.5, and now we can go down to uh, 45.2, which is significantly better, and uh, we can kind of uh, we reduce the gap by about a factor two uh, compared to, to the lower down. <clears throat> so uh, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for listening and thanks for being up so early. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Are there any questions? So I have just one. Um, so since we you try to compare between without memory and with memory, shouldn't we now, since you really do a precise analysis, uh, take into account how much really time it takes to access the memory depending on the type of memory? So, like for example, so we, apparently you apply it to to MD5. So do you see the numbers changing a bit because you have to access, I guess, RAM with one terabyte of uh, no, when, uh, I don't, how, how much RAM did you use? Yes, what we used for way, for our example was a RAM of one terabyte. But uh, in this example, it doesn't matter that much because we don't access the memory very often. So the, the access time to the memory doesn't really come in. Another thing you could do is try to use disk memory, but we didn't really look at this. Uh, that could also be a way to, to improve things a little bit. Okay. But then, okay, so it, okay, the effect will be to uh, improve the, the memoryless, I guess, uh, algorithm in your table. So if you, if you take into account that it takes a few cycles to. Yes, yes, if you do uh, look at the time to access the memory, that would probably cost a little bit more, but uh, I think in most of the parameters we have, the, there, are, there are relatively few accesses to the memory, so it will be negligible. Okay, okay so no more questions, and thanks to the speaker again.